Hi, I'm Matthew Clementi, and I'm glad you're here today for another installment of the Psychologies of the Earth lecture series as a part of the Hosting Earth Conference being held at Boston College in April of 2022. This series is being put on uh, in collaboration with the Guestbook Project and also the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series through the Lynch School at Boston College. And we come together to talk to different philosophers, psychologists, thinkers around questions of the impact of the ecological crisis. Today, I'm very honored to be joined by Sean McGrath, who's a professor of philosophy at Memorial University of Newfoundland. He, he specializes and focuses on shelling. Uh, in 2019, he came out with a very important work, Thinking Nature, an essay in negative ecology. And he's also the founder of a nonprofit for a new earth, which focuses on and targets the lack of political will and kind of the general indifference we as human beings have to the ecological crisis. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, in every one of these talks, I usually begin with a similar question, which is around the theme of hosting Earth, around the theme of the conference, about the reciprocity that we share with the Earth as both host and guest of the Earth. And I kind of ask thinkers who I sit down with to take up that theme, however it strikes them, as kind of an inroad into this conversation. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, and then we'll kind of get the conversation underway. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the opportunity. I have thought a little bit about the theme, guesting, hosting, and of course it's crucial to consider ourselves guests on the earth. We know the earth has preceded us by several uh, million years and will exceed us as well. And so we are not the only ones. But I must say that my own entry point into this discussion is, is, is somewhat different than the typical way of problematizing our taking the earth for granted. And it concerns the issue of anthropocentrism. So while we could look at, let's say, the way the earth, um, the, the way the destiny of the earth is not coincident with human interests and human destiny, we could look at that as a kind of humiliating moment whereby we de-anthropocentrize the discourse. And of course, we've had a lot of important contributions in this regard. In fact, I think that's the leitmotif of environmental thought from the middle of the 20th century until, until Timothy Morton's work. I, I actually think that there, one of the reasons that the political will is so lacking in our time for making the ecological change that is scientifically evident is precisely because this critique, this critique of anthropocentrism is somehow missing the target. We're not, prob prob we're not problematizing the human position correctly when we regard ourselves as one species among many who, who needs to be limited, perhaps even reduced in numbers because it's becoming environmentally problematic or we need to recognize our, the, the, the equality of all creatures on the earth. Th this discussion, of course, is important, but there's something else about the human that's being missed when we think about it in these terms. And it's in that regard that I've entered the environmental discussion. I'm essentially a defender of the notion of the human difference. I, I think it's, it's somewhat indefensible to argue that the human being is one species among many, I also think that environmental discourse makes no sense from this perspective. For example, the, the heavy sense of human responsibility for climate change makes no sense if we are simply one species among many. Uh, that, that the fact that we are responsible for, for, the, you know, for the fate of the planet, as the rhetoric goes, indicates there's something particularly different about the human being and something has gone wrong in the human being, which has led us to the particular predicament we're in now. So, and I do not think the solution is to deny this difference, but rather to go more deeply into it and to, to go into its sources and to think about how, how this human difference has become some kind of toxin, some kind of poison, some kind of curse on the earth and how it could perhaps be transformed from within.
So, I mean, this touches really on the heart of the work you're doing with your nonprofit, which is trying to, it sounds like, um, assess why there is such indifference among human beings. And part of what leads to that is this notion that, um, that human beings are not somehow unique creatures and uniquely responsible, but also perhaps uniquely capable of uh, changing the trends and addressing this crisis. I mean, it reminds me of a little bit of the great line from Holderlin that Heidegger, of course, quotes, uh, where the danger is, there also the saving power lies, something along those lines, that by changing our gaze to see that human beings are uniquely responsible, we also see that there is something um, uh, the unique saving power, so to speak, lies in our hands as well. What is it that you see this change in rhetoric, this change in perspectives, this change in emphasis being able to lead us toward? What possibilities does it open if we do shift the focus and become more anthropocentric in our uh, approaches to this crisis? Yeah, uh, the, the Holderland quote is actually the, uh, the leitmotif of my book. So, and that's exactly to the point. And my, my inspiration is largely 19th century in this regard. So the idea that we are nature become conscious of itself, that there's, you know, while of course all of nature is, uh, is, uh, has, has, a, has its own agenda, our, our position in that agenda is to be the mirror of nature, to be the place where na nature be becomes a, a theme for itself and becomes a problem to itself. And this is precisely what's happening now. And that's why the polar bear doesn't bear the burden of responsibility for correcting the course of things, but the human being, the microcosm uh, is the issue. Now, before I go more deeply into the question of uh, political will, I also want to say that I recognize this is a very Western view. And I, my, my sense is that we need all hands on board. So people are gonna to have to come at this from various different cultural perspectives and particularly different religious perspectives. So what I see happening is that we are struggling towards giving birth to a new ecological civilization. And this e ecological civilization will have earth as the common theme among a variety of traditions, religious and non-religious, political and otherwise. And, but each will come to it you know, through his or her own symbolic. And so I am interested in the, the Western symbolic and particularly the Christian symbolic. So I would actually speak not of an anthropocentric ecology, but a theocentric ecology. And that the real problem of course, is that we've put ourselves in the place of God and made nature our other. When in fact nature from its original conception in, as natura in the Latin West is the other of God, not the other of the human. And, and once that relation is restored, then we need not deny the human difference in order to um, achieve a more earth-centered uh, Christian spirituality, for example. So some, something like that is on my mind, but also of course the, the failure of political will. So I think it's not news. You know, We've had a half century of ecology and climatology and there's still no will. I think the, the COP26 was a, was a, a, a sort of devastating reminder that we are, you know, we are hurling headlong towards the four degree mark. We couldn't be better informed about it. Grade school children can explain the greenhouse effect. You know, climatology is the greatest collaborative scientific achievement in the history of humanity, I think. And still there is no will. So clearly this is not a problem of information and science. Uh, it's a problem of politics, you could say, but behind politics, I'm a Weberian in this regard, is religion. And so I think that religion is both, both the problem and the solution in this regard. And so what I'm interested in discussing further is how the Western religious imaginary is at the very, you know, it's the very root of the poison, Lynn White Jr.'s thesis. And as you say, quoting Holderlin, therein lies the saving power as well. So how can we rethink the human being as somehow destined to be the center point for earth energies, the place where earth energies become conscious of themselves, morally deliberate and so on. Uh, how, can we, how can we think this in such a way as to undo the utilitarian turn for lack of a better term? And would you say that, um... I mean, I'm thinking, I'm just, I guess, wondering whether or not this 
mode of rethinking the human, rethinking our place in the world is already latent within these traditions? Are there, you know, where do you see the touch points where we can retrieve these ideas? Or is it uh, the job of contemporary human beings to rethink, to think things anew? So I'm curious, kind of, you know, you're, you're shelling, obviously a shelling scholar. So, but where are the touch points for you to retrieve these notions that you want to draw forth? Or where are we kind of creating a new religious ethos? I think that the emphasis on what is to come, on the newness of, of the ecological civilization that we're struggling to build is a crucial motif. So I'm deeply interested in the eschatological core of the gospel and the, secular, the secularized eschatology of modern narratives of progress and emancipation and the eschatological thrust of environmental thinking. So here, here's a place where I think you know, my tradition, the broadly Christian tradition has something important to offer because we've routinely forgotten the future oriented nature of Christianity. Christianity is not a religion of the past. It's not a commemoration of an event. It's an anticipation of something to come. We are in the midst of a movement towards something. Uh, Christ is the midpoint of an act, of a, of a, of a three-part drama. The third act is still to come. And in this regard, Christian thinking turns to ecology, it finds an abundance of resources to recover its eschatological edge. So for example, with regard to the human, we don't know what a human being is. We have clues. The Christ is the clue to what a human being is, but the fullness of what the human is perhaps has not yet been revealed because the fullness of humanity, humanity doesn't yet exist. That's a theological way of thinking about it. But one of the gifts of climatology is that it's given us tools for thinking the deep human future. So one of the things I've done with my nonprofit is I've gathered scientists together with especially in the humanities and we've staged public interventions in national parks and that kind of thing in order to bring the, you know, the, the wealth of ecological uh, knowledge out of the university and into the marketplace. And there was one lecture in particular that came from a, a chemist uh, who works on ocean chemistry. And he more or less demonstrated, I'll, 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 uh, I won't go into the details, but he demonstrated that 10,000 years from now, uh, we have every reason to believe that all of the CO2 emitted in the industrial age will have been absorbed into the ocean with detrimental effect. There'll be a great acidification and will have been calci calcified once again, and the earth will be verdant, the seas will be teeming 10,000 years from now. And when, when he said that, everybody said, oh, great, 10,000 years, everything will be well, as though that's some distant point of the future. But let's think now about human history, okay? 10,000 years is, what is it, 5% uh, uh, of 200,000. 200,000 years is our best guess at the age, the, the, the age of modern humans. So, and 10,000 years is also, of course, the length of the Holocene. So we could say that we've had 10,000 years of civilization. And if we consider the whole of modern history to be a century, that's like the last five years of the human century. So when we think about it in this regard, we suddenly see that actually we're kind of new at this civilization game. And we might be, in fact, rather than the latecomers, as Heidegger put it, we might be the newcomers. We might be, and I think this is a, a helpful way to think ecologically, we might be the primitives of a new civilization, an ecological civilization that is to come because the future of civilization will be ecological or it will not be. Something like this, I think, has a chance of engaging both the imagination and the politics of our time because it, it, it speaks to a future of the human. Why should we be interested in a future without us? It's not interesting. It's not gonna galvanize the political will that is needed to speak about a, an earth without us, for example. Uh, so we need to think about ourselves and we need to think about what we want for our future. And just one last point on this, you know, with regard to saving the planet, um, the planet's fine. It's going to be absolutely fine. It can, it can withstand all kinds of CO2. We've had way more in the atmosphere before. Uh, the planet will be fine even without any life on it. it, had a long history without it. It's not the planet that lies in our hands, so to speak. It's our civilization. What is it about our civilization that we could imagine carrying forward 10,000 years? I, for one, can't imagine consumerism going forward even another century. So we've got to start to think about a human 
civilization, a human destiny, which, is, which has transitioned from this precarious moment of birth into something sustainable. You know what really resonates with me about this idea, and it's one of the thoughts that I've had often about this crisis, is that um, the conversation, the talk, the apocalyptic talk around uh, the eco-crisis is often this very notion that we're destroying the planet. And as you say, of course, the planet can survive. It's we who will not survive, right? That's what is at stake and is at risk in major ways. While you were talking, I was thinking about it. I mean, what you're doing with your research and with your nonprofit seems to me to be fighting uh, two battles at once. You're fighting the apathy and indifference of kind of where we're at, but then also trying to counter the narratives of those who are really concerned with the crisis and recognize it for the crisis that it is, because there's something um, that's not helpful to galvanize people to speak about things in terms of, uh, you know, a, a post-human future or a world without human beings. I wonder how, um, where you think we can redirect this conversation. Obviously, the example that you just gave was a really good one, thinking about uh, how short our time span on Earth has actually been. But beyond that, say you're talking to someone who's used to thinking of the crisis in terms of uh, what the world will be like without human beings or imagining a future without our impact on the world. How do you kind of shift back to this anthropocentric vision? What, are, what else can we uh, draw people into those conversations? Well, I think, first of all, when we start to talk to young people about saving our civilization rather than saving the planet, it raises the question, well, what is there about our civilization that we would carry forward? You know, what is it that we're attached to? I mean, do, do we like the fact that education is accessible to most young people in the Western context? Do we, would we like to have an educated future? You know, what, 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 you know, what kinds of, what forms of life do we find to be worth protecting and preserving? It's not obviously sustaining uh, consumerism at all costs. Uh, and, and I think that this, this, this focuses on the human being as properly understood as a natural event. You know, we are a natural event and uh, we, we, are, we are put into our own hands in a certain way. I'm, I'm a follower of Hardiger on this. You know, we are the being for whom being is an issue. And so our, our concern with being really has to begin with our concern with our own being and who it is we are and how we are living. And in this regard, I think that I have, you know, I share, for example, the, the, the broad environmental consensus that consumer capitalism is the problem. Usually it's just called capitalism and that's, that's not specific enough. There's far too many forms of capitalism uh, to, to just vilify capitalism. But if we look at the first part of that, the consumer bit, th therein lies something very interesting from the perspective of, you know, environmental psychology. Why are we so committed to consumerism? What exactly is it that we feed from in consumerism? And what I've argued is that consumerism really should be regarded as a religious attitude. It's born of a kind of a set of perversions of Christian values that have actually now been globalized and effect much more effectively secularized than any other aspect of Christianity. And so once we, once we start to realize that we're in the grip of some kind of pseudo spirituality, pseudo self transcendence, because people don't shop for stuff, they shop for new selves. This is one of my arguments, they're shopping for a new self, they're shopping for uh, a future. And they, in other words, they are in the grips of an eschatological consciousness, in which we are unfinished beings, and have a role to play in our self completion. And yet it has been truncated into something without transcendence, wherein our decisions really have to do with, you know, what kind of products we're going to consume or what kind of trips we're going to have or what kind of experiences we're going to curate for ourselves through Airbnb or whatever. And if no one's particularly satisfied from it. Uh, so, you know, that's where I'd like to steer the discussion into a kind of, uh, I'd like to offer a kind of Christian critique of what most of us can agree on is the problem namely our dedication to a form of capitalism which emphasizes consumption as an end in itself. And uh, I think offer a, 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 um, somewhat of a privileged analysis of it because I agree with Lynn White Jr. that it's Christianity that bears the guilt here and no other tradition. And so we ought to know best 
what's going on here, or at least be in a position to understand best what went wrong. You know, it strikes me that um, while, of course, this philosophy that you're putting forth, this worldview, is in many ways, it's, it's your, as you're saying rightly, eschatological, it's, it synthesizes both the apocalyptic and the eschatological, right? It's that the, um, like to keep it in the Christian religious context, it's that there is this kind of original sin, there is this ability that human beings have to be both uh, the worst and best, right? The, the most uh, curse, accursed, uh, you know? It's, it's kind of Kierkegaardian in the sense that the, the very worst thing about us is also potentially the very best thing about us, that we have That's this right. capacity for, for greatness, at both ends of the spectrum, uh, of the spectrum, we can be, you know, profoundly uh, destructive and profoundly creative. And, and there's that big kind of um, breath to the human being. And I find it strangely hopeful and, and you know, not strangely, I mean, of course, the eschatological is hopeful, but I find it uh, a very hopeful uh, way of viewing the crisis, that the crisis is a crisis, to, to quote Nietzsche, in the way that a pregnancy can be a crisis or, a, you know, you're both, it's a sickness that's pregnant with the future. And I find that to be a very humanistic approach, obviously, and naturally is. Um, and one that opens on to kind of, or, or provokes kind of a, a reimagining, an invitation to a reimagining of what we can be and what we're capable of. There's something very hopeful about it. And so I wonder psychologically, you know, we're in the psychologies of the earth, how this learning to think this way, to view ourselves this way, to view the crisis this way as, as something that is potentially pregnant with the future might change the way we understand um, the psychological toll that the ecological crisis has taken on human beings. Because of course there's great psychological effects and and people are being affected and impacted by the eco crisis. But how would this kind of reimagining of the human person change that? And where do you see the potentials going forward with that? Hope is, is the big issue. And we don't want to kind of cheap hope. So I, I tend to distinguish hope from optimism. For example, as you, dis, as you spoke, I, I, my thought was that yes, there is hope, but there might not be any hope for us. And you probably know uh, that what most uh, climate change activists are the, the the better informed ones are not saying is that there's a carbon legacy which is going to play its play itself out regardless of what we do now. That if we if we if we you know if we even even in the most favorable circumstance of reducing the emissions to zero by 2050, there is a there is a legacy that's going to play itself out. And the things that are happening in the world right now, floods, fires, so on, and the social instability from desertification, uh, we might be destined for that. So the chaos that we're in may be the destiny for our generation and maybe my son's generation. So what we're planning for, and this is why, this is the gift of climate climatology, we're planning, what we should be planning for is the deep human future. We need to start to be able to be more comfortable imagining a, a deep human future as the as the geologists are comfortable imagining a, a deep future for the earth. We need to become more comfortable thinking about, as I said, 10,000 years from now, what does human civilization look like? Now, I've, before I discovered the gospel, I was a big fan of sci-fi. So science fiction uh, fans uh, will be probably more adept at this than others. But I mean, there, there's something we can learn from this, right? There's, there's a lot of different ways in which we can be human on this earth. And we seem to be stuck in a pattern that we, you know, the, the, the famous quote, we can more easily imagine the end of the, uh, the world than the end of capitalism. That, that's a real issue. Why, why, have we, why have we become so truncated in our imaginative capacities, which is arguably our greatest gift, is that we can think towards a possibility that has never before been, and yet we're stuck in, uh, in fantasizing about uh, fantasizing that there's only really one way to arrange you know, 8 billion people in the Anthropocenic age on the earth. So we, we need to, to free up the imaginative capacities in the human being in order to deploy some energy towards change. And in particular, 
I think the great challenge, and we shouldn't underestimate how big it is, is that we're being asked to make sacrifices, not for our children's children, but for our children's children's children, for people who will no longer remember our names. And, and no generation has ever been asked to do that. You know, Aristotle can imagine an ethic that, that goes to the next generation, for example, but to imagine an ethic, an ethic that places the, the flourishing of, uh, of human beings hundreds of years from now above our immediate um, interests, that is a moral uh, paradigm I, that to my knowledge, as we have never been in as human beings. So this is a really difficult place to be. And I, th this is why I think that the religious imaginary, all the religious imaginaries are really gonna need to be deployed here because it's touching at the very core of our identities as human beings in the 21st century. Uh, so my own modest contribution is to say that the Christian uh, in particular has some work to do with regard to thinking who the Christ is, who the human is, and who we will be. You know, not unlike Paul coming to terms with the fact that actually the, the Christ is not coming in his generation and maybe not coming uh, for many generations. And that whole change in consciousness, which is really pivotal for the consolidation of Christian identity, which occurs in the first century. Something like that needs to happen ecologically for all humans, and in particular for the, for the Christian vis-a-vis uh, -vis the deep future. So yeah, I don't have any particular insight on how to pull it off, but I know that information is not gonna do it. This is not a problem for science to solve. John McGrath, thank you so much for joining me today. This has just been such a lively and insightful conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another uh, talk in this series, Psychologies of the Earth, co-hosted between the Guestbook Project and the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Lecture Series at the Lynch School of Boston College. And please stay tuned for more lectures and talks in this series in the months to come. Thank you. <laughs>